In competitive melee, the ledge is a powerful mechanic that many strategies revolve around. In particular, the 37 frames of intangibility granted upon grabbing the ledge are what make it so notorious. While there are times and places for basic ledge options such as get up attack and get up roll, high level melee requires you to utilize advanced ledge options much more often than these. Advanced ledge options always begin by falling from the ledge while your character is still intangible, then choosing from a variety of options that allow you to get back on stage safely stall on the ledge or edge guard your opponent. Among the options I just mentioned, ledge dashing is one of, if not the most important. Ledge dashing refers to the act of falling from the ledge while still intangible, then double jumping and landing with an air dodge on stage. After a ledge dash, it is possible for some characters to have gallant, which stands for grounded actionable ledge intangibility. Gallant frames allow you to perform on stage options with intangibility you wouldn't normally have, making them an extremely powerful resource. Despite the importance of ledge dashing, it is one of the least explored options in the game. Even the best melee players perform their ledge dash inputs with little consideration for the science behind them. I first realized that this science existed during the development of the box controller which mostly took place in 2017 and 2018. Because I needed to select specific air dodge coordinates to give this controller, I didn't want my choices to be arbitrary. What I couldn't have predicted, however, was that choosing these coordinates would end up being so complicated that it would take me over a year to solve. As you might have guessed, the coordinates I chose have to do with the ledge. In the process of developing the box, I came across information that would be beneficial to any melee player looking to perfect their ledge dashes. In this video, I'll be sharing all of this information, and I'll be doing so from the perspective of a GameCube controller user. If you're a fan of this kind of melee content, I'd greatly appreciate if you'd consider subscribing to my channel, as it would help me make more of it in the future. Before we get into the complicated stuff, let's go over some of the basics, starting with getting your character onto the ledge. This is usually done by facing inwards and wave dashing backwards. Right off the bat, an important fact to know is that a fast fall cannot take place until the third frame spent off stage. Luckily, fast falls can be buffered up to three frames before they take place, which makes this an easy input to perform frame perfectly. The next stat doesn't get talked about much, but some characters snap to the ledge faster than others. Marth, for example, grabs the ledge on the 7th frame off stage, which is as slow as it gets among the good characters. As the chart shows, it takes between 4 and 7 frames for each of these characters to grab the ledge. This can decide whether or not you're able to make it to the ledge first in a nail-biter situation, so it's important to keep this in mind. Upon grabbing the ledge, your character gains 37 frames of intangibility. Of these 37 frames, the first 7 are called cliff catch, while everything past that is called cliff weight. When a character is in cliff catch, they are inactionable. Then, on the first frame of cliff weight, three actions become possible. Ledge attack, ledge roll, and ledge jump. The second frame of cliff weight is when ledge get up, and most importantly, ledge fall become possible. Ledge fall is the starting point for advanced ledge options, which is why this frame in particular is crucial. Finally, the earliest possible double jump can be done on the frame directly after you ledge fall. The other important piece of information to go over is where a ledge fall can be performed on the analog stick. Backward and downward are to be expected, but I want to highlight how ledge falling forward works. There is a 50 degree line in the quadrant in front of you that separates ledge fall from regular getup, the latter of which you should look to avoid. Soon it will be clear why the area below this 50 degree line is the most important one to know about when ledge dashing. Now that the basics are out of the way, I'll start by explaining the pros and cons of ledge falling in each of the regions I just showed you, as well as why I believe there to be a clear-cut best choice. In particular, I want to talk about a tendency many players have, which is attempting to avoid fast falling during a ledge dash sequence. To do so, they choose between the travel routes I've drawn in red. Unlike the green route, these two routes remain above the fast fall threshold, and so they eliminate the chance of an accidental fast fall. It's important to understand why people try to avoid fast falling in the first place. An overview of Fox's ideal ledge dash inputs will make this clear. Generally, you want to ledge fall on frame 1, double jump on frame 2, then air dodge on frame 5 with Fox. This requires you to time your air dodge for 3 frames after your double jump. But what happens if you fail to jump on exactly frame 2? Since this will inevitably happen due to human error, we have to be aware of the consequences. Assuming you jam the stick downwards, you'll fast fall. Then, let's assume you input your double jump on frame 3. This is where the problem comes up. The old timing for your air dodge will no longer work. 
Because Fox dipped further down by fast falling on frame 2, he actually has to double jump for 4 frames or else his air dodge won't make it on stage. It is very likely that you'll SD when this happens if you were planning on air dodging 3 frames after jumping. In theory, the workaround to this dilemma is to ledge fall with an analog stick input that cannot perform a fast fall. This way, if you make the same mistake as before, Fox won't dip down as far on frame 2. Now Fox can succeed a ledge dash with the same input timings you'd normally use, even if you initiate the jump on frame 3. The takeaway is that by not fast falling, you create a 2 frame window for your jump input as opposed to a 1 frame window if you fast fell. Based on this information, it would appear that there's no reason to ever risk fast falling. The problems with not fast falling may not exist in theory, but they exist in actuality. This is because all of the methods that can be used to avoid a fast fall come with one major flaw. They make no effort to jump forward. While I haven't gone over the importance of jumping forward just yet, understand for now that failing to do so costs you consistency in other ways. And while these travel routes can spend a few extra frames to make it to forward, this comes at a cost. You'll be wasting intangibility frames in the process. For these reasons, I've always believed that trying to avoid fast falling creates more problems than it solves. For section 2 of the video, I'll be transitioning right into why jumping with forward trajectory during a ledge dash is so important. I'll start by explaining the difference between jump trajectory and aerial drift, as these two things can easily be confused. Jump trajectory specifically refers to the x-axis value that you register on the exact frame that you double jump, while aerial drift refers to the values you input afterwards. Between these two things, jump trajectory is much more impactful as it determines the arc your character follows for the rest of their double jump. During a ledge dash, this is important for advancing your character towards the stage. To show you why jump trajectory matters, let's take a look at two clips of Sheik attempting to ledge dash. In the first clip, Sheik falls on frame 1, then double jumps without any trajectory on frame 2. The aerial drift and air dodge values I chose for her afterwards aren't enough to make it on stage. In the second clip, Sheik jumps with a small amount of forward trajectory. From that point on, she uses the exact same aerial drift and air dodge values as before. This time, Sheik makes it on stage. The microscopic distance she closed by jumping forward was what made the difference. Jumping forward isn't always necessary when ledge dashing, but it is universally true that it will make ledge dashing easier. This is why I endorse jamming the stick down and forward to fall from the ledge. There are still plenty of other factors to consider when ledge dashing, but for now keep this one in mind. The third step to ledge dashing is understanding that a shallow air dodge is a contributing factor towards a successful ledge dash. To illustrate the importance of a shallow air dodge, let's revisit the two chic clips I just showed you. In the first clip, Sheik missed her jump trajectory completely, then failed her ledge dash. But Sheik actually could have succeeded this ledge dash had her air dodge not been so steep. Watch what happens when I reload the save state and air dodge at a shallower angle. This time Sheik makes it on stage. As this diagram shows, any of the angles in green would have caused Sheik to make it on stage from this position. The reason Sheik originally SD'd is because her air dodge was outside of this range. Now let's rewatch the second clip in which Sheik jumped forward and made it on stage with a rather steep air dodge angle. This diagram reveals that by jumping forward, Sheik increased the range of viable air dodge angles by a considerable amount. The air dodge angle I chose in the clip was well within the range that would have made it on stage. The diagrams I just showed you reveal an important concept. Jump trajectory and air dodge shallowness are inversely correlated. What this means is that if you miss your jump trajectory, a ledge dash can still usually be salvaged with a shallow air dodge. On the other hand, if you nail your jump trajectory, a shallow air dodge may not be necessary. The takeaway here is that by succeeding one half of the execution test, you often remove the need for the other half. To incorporate both halves, try quickly swiping towards shallow air dodge angles after performing the diagonal ledge fall. This will increase the likelihood that you hit either one of them at the very least. The fourth step to ledge dashing is understanding that while shallow air dodges help your ledge dashes succeed, steep air dodges do have their time and place. This is because steep air dodges help you land faster and maximize your galint. In the Sheik clips for example, I chose a steep air dodge for a reason. This angle allows Sheik to land on stage on the exact frame she air dodges, which in this case grants her 9 galint. Now, take a look at what happens with a shallower angle. Sheik hovers in midair for 3 frames before she lands. 
This causes Sheik to lose 3 frames of Galant, which can make a huge difference. In situations where your opponent is right next to the ledge, it is often better to prioritize Galant. By landing on stage faster, you'll be able to attack your opponent earlier and win out on situations that you wouldn't have won had you chosen a shallower ledge dash. In this case, Sheik actually had four different amounts of Galant to choose from, which just goes to show how complicated the decision making behind a ledge dash can be. The fifth aspect of ledge dashing is stage selection. Believe it or not, the stage you're playing on affects how difficult it is to ledge dash. The six tournament legal stages are conveniently separated into two categories. Battlefield, Dreamland, and Fountain of Dreams are easier, while Final Destination, Yoshi Story, and Pokemon Stadium are harder. To be clear, the stages within each of these categories are identical to each other in terms of difficulty. At this point, you're probably wondering why some stages make it harder to ledge dash. At first, I struggled to figure this out myself. My guess was that the ledge was further down on certain stages, but this ended up not being true. On every stage, the ledge is located at the exact same distance below the ground floor. This means that the difference between them has to do with something else. Eventually, I realized that the wall next to the ledge is constructed differently on certain stages. On the harder stages, the wall will conflict with your character's ability to jump towards the stage, whereas this won't happen on the easier stages. Take a look at how Fox is able to advance towards Battlefield on the first frame of his double jump, but on Final Destination, he hardly moves forward. This has consequences later on in the ledge dash when it comes time for Fox to air dodge. On Battlefield, Fox ends up closer to the stage, which means he has more leniency on his air dodge than he does on FD. While the increase in difficulty may not seem like that much, it is big enough that it shouldn't be ignored. For this reason, I recommend keeping the stages in mind when ledge dashing. The sixth and most complicated section of this video has to do with selecting your ECB. ECB, which stands for Environmental Collision Box, is an orange diamond on your character that determines when they've made contact with surfaces such as the floor. As you cycle through different animations, your ECB will change in a seemingly unpredictable way, but the reality is that ECBs do follow specific patterns. In particular, there is an ECB pattern that is reused in many scenarios. This pattern consists of 9 or 10 frames that we'll call ECB freeze frames, followed by one frame that we'll call the ECB reset frame. The easiest way to understand how these frames work is to take a look at what happens when a character jumps from the ground floor. In this clip, for example, Fox completes his jump squat, then goes airborne. The first 9 frames he spends in the air maintain a similar ECB, but on frame 10, Fox's ECB shrinks significantly. This is the reset frame I was referring to. Whenever a reset frame goes through, your character's ECB will reset to what we'll call the reset ECB. The reset ECB is the ECB you are intended to have for a specific animation if you are unable to keep a different ECB frozen. But what happens if we input a double jump on exactly the reset frame? Well, let's take a look. Just like last time, I'll have Fox go airborne for 9 frames, but this time I'll input a double jump on frame 10. Surprisingly, this causes Fox's original ECB to renew for another 9 freeze frames. His ECB will then reset on the 10th frame after the double jump. The clips I just showed you revealed some important information about ECB behavior. In the first clip, Fox's ECB was left uninterrupted, so it froze for 9 frames and reset on the 10th. Then, in the second clip, Fox's ECB was renewed with a double jump on frame 10, at which point it lasted another 9 frames. This showed us that a double jump can be used to preserve the previous ECB and restart the countdown. In case you're wondering, this renewal can also occur earlier than when it took place in the second clip. For example, I could have double jumped on frame 5 and it would have commenced the same process. To show you how ECB freezes apply to ledge dashing, let's revisit the frame data I presented at the start of the video. Upon grabbing the ledge, your character gains a 10 frame ECB freeze, which is one more frame than they gained in the previous scenario. As I said earlier, ECB freezes can last for 9 or 10 frames depending on the scenario, and this one happens to be a 10 frame freeze. The remaining frames of cliff catch and the first frame of cliff wait then bring us to a total of 8 freeze frames where you aren't able to ledge fall just yet. The next 3 frames of cliff wait are where things get interesting, as they consist of 2 freeze frames and 1 reset frame that you're actionable during. So for example, if you fall from the ledge on frame 9 and double jump on frame 10 or 11, you'll renew your ECB for another 9 frames. On the other hand, if you wait until frame 11 or later to fall from the ledge, there will be no way to prevent your ECB from resetting. 
even if you double jump on frame 12, it will already have been too late. For now, I want to highlight what happens when you successfully freeze your ECB a second time with your double jump. Assuming you're planning on ledge dashing, the latest you can air dodge while keeping the frozen ECB is on the ninth frame of the new freeze. Right off the bat, this raises the question of which characters can double jump, then air dodge on stage within a 9 frame window. Marth, for example, always requires more than 9 frames to elevate himself above the stage. This means that Marth's ECB will always reset during a ledge dash. In total, there are 6 characters who can't air dodge on stage within the 9 frame window, and 5 characters who can. Because these five characters can keep a frozen ECB and use it to ledge dash, they have a lot more to think about, especially when you consider how many different ways there are to grab the ledge. Let's take Fox for example. Earlier I showed you a chart of Fox's ledge dash frame data, but what I didn't tell you at the time is that this chart uses his reset ECB. If Fox grabs the ledge with one ECB in particular, it is actually possible for him to ledge dash on frame 4, which is earlier than anything shown on the previous chart. This ECB requires you to grab the ledge on frame 21, 22, or 23 of your double jump. Notice how this gives Fox an exceptionally high ECB that allows him to air dodge on stage earlier than usual. This is the only way in the game for Fox to get a 16 galint ledge dash. On the other hand, there are undesirable ECBs as well. The most common undesirable ECB is the one you receive when you wave dash backward and fast fall to the ledge. Players will often SD when they try to ledge dash with this ECB without knowing why. The reason is that this keeps the ECB your character has when they are on the ground floor, which is so tall that it requires most characters to double jump for an extra frame before they air dodge, otherwise they won't make it on stage. If you know you have this ECB, it's probably a good call to wait for it to reset before attempting to ledge dash. It's impossible to go over every ECB within a single video, so figuring out the best ones to use is going to require some research on your end. The main piece of advice I have, which is probably the most important piece of advice in the entire video, is that if you're playing one of the characters who can take advantage of modified ECBs, you should practice two ledge fall timings, frame 9 and frame 11. The best way to do this is to use the Uncle Punch training mode ISO and turn on ledge dash info so that you can see your ledge fall timings in game. Just so you know, the Uncle Punch ISO considers a frame 9 ledge fall to be a frame 1 ledge fall, and a frame 11 ledge fall to be a frame 3 ledge fall. As far as how to apply these ledge fall timings, a frame 11 ledge fall is useful because it guarantees that your ECB has been reset, which makes all ledge dash inputs identical to each other. This can increase your consistency significantly. A frame 11 ledge fall can also be used to wait out bad ECBs so that they don't cause you to SD. At the same time, the reasons to ledge fall on frame 9 and preserve your modified ECB shouldn't be overlooked. As I showed you, modified ECBs can be higher up on your character, which can allow you to air dodge a frame earlier than normal and gain a frame of galint. Modified ECBs also come with the advantage of ledge falling on frame 9 rather than waiting 2 extra frames. These translate to yet another 2 frames of galint. I hope this video has been helpful at teaching you how to perfect your ledge dashes. I know that there's a lot of information to intake, but if you can incorporate some of it, you'll definitely become much more threatening at the ledge. In the interest of time, I didn't touch on techniques such as no impact lands and aerial interrupts from the ledge in this video. I may do a video on these in the future, but for now, the best advice I can give you is that these techniques are ECB dependent as well. If you're having trouble performing them consistently, there's a good chance that you need to take a look at the ECBs that you're giving your character.